Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well today. Sun shining. It's a been a little bit warmer week than uh, previous previous weeks recently. Uh, I guess we're having an early spring, or maybe it'll snow next week. I'm not sure which. It's Georgia, so anything's possible. But it's nice out, and uh, glad to, to see y'all. Hope y'all enjoy our service this morning. We do have a few announcements. Um, the must jar is there. I remembered it this week. We need to maintain our giving to must ministries to help them as they support our community, help those who are in need of food and shelter. Um, and uh, our contributions are greatly appreciated. They've sent us several letters thanking us for that contribution, and we need to keep that up. Uh, there will be a trustee meeting today immediately following the worship service. And uh, so if that tr the word trustee applies to you, please show up for the meeting. And uh, we will keep it as short as possible. Uh, no celebrations this week other than just celebrating that we're all here. We can celebrate that. Um, and let's see, other announcements. I want to remind everybody about our efforts to get people praying for the church. Uh, we have asked that you choose between 8 in the morning or 8 in the evening, or if you're adventurous in your prayer life, you can pray for us twice a day. Um, but prayer is powerful, and having multiple people praying at the same time of day for the future of our church is, a, is an important thing. Uh, also a reminder about the shredding event uh, that will take place in Marietta. Uh, let's see, Porter Park on March 9th between 9 in the morning and noon. You'll be able to go by there and have any documents that need to be, need to be shredded, have them shredded. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. I uh, hope you enjoy our service today, and we are going to proceed with our first scripture reading.
morning we do have a couple of additions to our prayer request and I got an email um, what was the name from yeah, the person he was asking oh okay um, we know Scott needs prayer but I know he has he's listed um, Patrice Monica Monica P-A-T-R-I-C-E-M-O-N-C-A-N. All right. And so, also Hunter and Annie from McAfee. Uh, they're expecting a, a uh, child, a son, in July the 4th. So yeah. did you keep that thing in your prayers? So we need to pray for the coming new addition to the McAfee family, and we also need to pray for Patrice. And, uh, does anybody else have a prayer request they'd like to add this morning? All right. In addition to those just mentioned, we want to be praying for Becky Newton and Cindy Franklin. We want to continue praying for Alton Waits, Anna Marie and Dave, Amanda Schmidt, Bobby, Carol Fuller, Camille Munoz, Caroline, Elizabeth Fagan, Faye Mew, Jean Smith, Graham Sykes, Jack Lamberson, Jean Kibler, Joan Hill, Logan Smith, Margaret Hughes, Marguerite Kaler, Margaret Danny Simpson, Marlo Keith, Martha Childers, Phyllis McLean, Ray Tucker, Ron Johnson, Sandy, Sarah Polk, Victor Blackstone, Wendy Tedder, Willie Neal Kane. We want to pray for the residents of Gaines Park, Gaines Park, where we carry our monthly service. We want to continue praying for those who've been victims of natural disasters or violence around our world those whose lives have been turned upside down and in many cases their homes destroyed or the loss of loved ones. We want to pray for all of these. We want to continue praying for our church. We also want to celebrate with Betty Hope who had a successful surgery and is recovering. us this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your presence among us. We're grateful for the freedom to gather and worship you as we see fit. We thank you for providing these wonderful facilities and all of the things that we need to make worship a special thing for us. We ask that you reach out your hand, that you bring healing and strength and recuperation and recovery to all those that we have named. That through your mighty hands we might find strength and comfort. That you might reach out to all of our leaders and bring them wisdom so that they might make decisions and take actions that are pleasing to you and that will straighten the way for all of your children. We thank you for all of the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us, things that all too often we fail to notice or fail to give thanks for. We praise your holy name and we ask that you extend your power of healing as we have requested. In the name of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You will find the Apostles' Creed in your bulletin. I would ask that you join me in the reading of our statement of faith. 
Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the commission of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we're about five minutes ahead of schedule here, which means I have to preach really, really slow. <laughs> the scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And that's 8, 31 through 38. It says, Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke openly about this. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
But after turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Then Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and because of the gospel will save it. For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his life? What can a person give in exchange for his life? For if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Word of God for the people of God. If that sounds a little different from what you're used to hearing, that's, that came from the New English translation, which is, according to the experts I talk to, <laughs> the uh, most accurate and, and thorough translation of, that's been made of the Bible in many years. So I, uh, I have been using that off and on recently. So what did Jesus mean when he said to deny oneself? It means a lot of different things. It is not just that we need to deny our wants, our self-centered desires, to dot does yeah, excuse me, to deny oneself for Christ means to give up ego. To give up who we are in this world and seek to discover who we are in God's world. During the span of our lives, we aspire to certain positions, certain accomplishments, there's certain things that we want in life. Our wants may be things like fancy clothes or cars or large fancy homes these days some people pay hundreds of dollars for a pair of tennis shoes I know I've gotten old because that sounds really crazy to me I have friends that do that Usually the things that we want, the things that we aspire to, the things that we set our eyes on, are extensions of the things that we enjoy doing. For instance, if, uh, if we love music, maybe we want a really high-tech, high-end stereo system to listen to music. Or maybe we're willing to pay all of that extra money to sit on the front row to hear our favorite bands or symphonies play. If we're really into technology, maybe we want the most expensive computer we can afford or a laptop. Kim and I's next door neighbor recently bought a computer for gaming. Larry's in his late 70s, but he likes to play video games. He has a $5,000 computer now that he plays video games on. When I was a kid and during the earlier years of our generation's experience, things like fancy china were important, or gemstones. I don't think any of the young people even have china on their wedding lists anymore. Nobody, nobody does that. Um, 
or for the men, the latest set of ping golf clubs. And I don't even think ping is supposed to be the best anymore. That, that's probably old news too. Or maybe a fast boat. Or maybe box seats at, uh, well, I was going to say the Falcons games, but nobody's that silly. Uh, maybe box seats for the Braves games, though. That, that'd be good. But our wants and our desires reflect what we enjoy, what our goals are. They also reflect somewhat how we've been reared. Um, I can promise you that my parents did not rear a child stupid enough to sleep on the sidewalk so that he could get the latest iPhone the next morning. Um, maybe that sounds a little harsh, but <laughs> I hope nobody in here is one of those folks. Um, you know, it, the material things in life make up a big part of our wish lists. Or I think, well, it's probably old school now too, but I was going to say bucket list, things that we want. Um, maybe we want a promotion at work or a change in our career. Maybe we want to start a new business so we can be the boss. These are all things that we may aspire to and desire, but are they really who we are? Each of us has an image of ourselves, and this image that we have of ourselves, we start forming pretty early in life based on our environment, our culture, and how we're reared. And is shaped by a lot of different things, and at least largely shaped by our experiences and the things that we are told. Y'all have probably figured out by now that my mother and my grandmother thought I was the smartest human being ever born. You would have figured that out because you figured out that I think I know everything. Sometimes. But our environment affects the self-image that we have of ourselves, whether it's a good self-image or a poor self-image. You know, we may go through life seeing ourselves as the good guy in the story, or the hero even. Or we may be, perceived, may be driven by some perceived need something we think that we don't have that we really need to get by in life. Whatever the image of ourselves is, whether it's a good self-image or a bad self-image, if it's carried to the extreme, it has the potential to do great harm. Or in some cases, great good. But a huge part of what we see wrong in our country and around the world is that we place too much importance on who we are as individuals. Individuality is, is important up to a point. But can it cause us to do a lot of, of harm it can become extreme. We may become egocentric. We may even become what's called narcissistic, self-absorbed, self-centered. And these things keep us from seeing our own rebellion against God. Now, most of us don't have any trouble seeing other people's rebellion against God. We're really good at that. We can tell any number of people exactly what they've got wrong in life and exactly how they ought to be doing things. It's a lot harder for us to see ourselves that clearly. We're not robots. We weren't created with a cookie cutter. 
We are each unique. We do have individuality that was a gift from God, that was intentional. God has given each one of us different gifts, different abilities, different talents. And this is a blessing. But what God gave us is meant to be a blessing to the world, to be a blessing to those around us, not just a blessing to ourselves. Scripture I read today says, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and because of the gospel will save it. For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world yet forfeit his life? Now, Jesus is not telling us that each one of us have to be nailed to a cross and crucified on the mountain beside him. But he is telling us that we have to remove ourselves from the center of the universe. Some 400 years ago, a guy named Galileo discovered that the sun was the center of our solar system, and that all of the heavenly bodies, even Earth, revolved around the sun. Now, that doesn't shock any of us. We've all been taught that in school, and we all understand that, that the Earth revolves around the sun, unless one of our, never mind. Um, we all understand that. That's no shock. But during Galileo's day, everybody else in the world knew that all of the planets and the stars revolved around the Earth. The Earth was the center of the universe. It was considered heresy to say that the earth revolved around the sun. Of course we're the center of everything. God made us that way. He was reviled and his life was threatened for suggesting something as horrible as the idea that the earth revolved around the sun. And that's the way many people react when we suggest that they themselves are not the center of the universe. Most of y'all know that Kim and I do some dog sitting. I have spent my entire week this past week with four dogs who each believe that they are the center of the universe. And they are highly offended when one of the other dogs asserts itself or gets some attention. That's the way we act. What do you mean the world doesn't revolve around me and my needs and my wants and my goals? We've all struggled with this in one way or another. And many of us still do. And we can rationalize how important our needs and our wants are In the book of Genesis, it says God created us in his image. Yet from the day that we are born, we try to recreate ourselves in our own image based on whatever our desires and goals are, based on whatever However, we're taught to think. We seek the things of this world, striving for comfort, for entertainment, for status, for acclaim, for power. Many of us just want validation. 
Yeah, I'm all, I already know that I'm right. I just need all of y'all to acknowledge that I'm right. We're driven by a lot of different things. We're driven by an image we've created of ourselves that we want to protect. And the more invested we get in our own self-image and in this image that we have built of ourselves, the harder it is for us to discover who we were truly meant to be. See, God did not create man. He did not create each one of us and each one of you so that we could serve our own petty little worlds. God created us for His purposes, His will, and His glory, not for ours. Not being able to let go of our own self-image, our own way of viewing ourselves, pretty easily demonstrated when we look at Washington, D.C. You know, there was a day, even in my lifetime, when Democrats and Republicans would compromise and get things done that benefited the American people. Imagine that. What a foreign, strange concept that is. That we should actually be willing to concede that somebody else's needs were just as important as ours. That we should listen to someone else's opinion rather than lock ourselves into a concrete, immovable defense of our own stance. When was the last time that anything important came out of Washington, D.C.? They can't get anything done because they're all too busy defending their own turf to even consider compromise. See, God didn't create me. He didn't create you just so we could come here and see how much wealth and comfort and, and status that we could each tear away from this world that we live in. The idea was that we would get together and benefit each other. We have to set aside our wants and our lusts and our goals and our aspirations, sometimes even our physical well-being, in order to become the person that God wants us to be. Joshua chapter 24 says, If you have no desire to worship the Lord, then choose today whom you will worship, whether it be the gods whom your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But I and my family will worship the Lord. Now, if you don't want to worship the gods beyond the Euphrates or you don't want to worship the gods of the Amorites, maybe you just want to worship your own self-image. But we have to make a choice. In Acts 
5, Peter says, Peter's and the apostles said, we must obey God rather than people. And John 15 says, if you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own. However, because you do not belong to the world, but because I chose you out of the world, for this reason, the world hates you. Well, we can't bear that idea. What would we do if the world didn't like us? Life would just come to an end as we know it. For many of us, the most important thing in the world is what other people think of us. And that creates so many problems, I can't even get into it. I can remember some years ago, one of my mentors told me, what other people think of you is none of your business. I could not understand that for the life of me. I couldn't even grasp what he was talking about. It's like, what do you mean? What could be more important than people liking me? I mean, I really did. I struggled with that. I struggled with that a lot. But you know, today I don't worry nearly as much about what other people think of me, what other people might be saying behind my back. And I sleep a lot better. <laughs> I don't spend nearly as many hours worrying. Because the relationship that's most important to me today is the one I have with God. And that's the one that I need to be focused on. One of the reasons that we struggle with living for God is that we view our decision to serve the Lord as a one-time event. There's a lot of churches we could go to who would present it to us exactly that way. Give yourself to Jesus. Get dunked under the water. You're good to go. That didn't work too well for me. I can't speak for any of you, but that didn't work too well for me. I walked down the aisle, gave my life to Jesus, got ducked under the water, and turned, turned into one of the worst heathens you have ever met in your lives. And stayed that way for a long time. It is not a one-time event. This is one of the many reasons that we need church. If you talk to the new age, it's not even... New age is now old age, I guess. I don't know what you would call our modern culture's attitude toward God and toward church. But the churches are shrinking. The vast majority of traditional denominations are shrinking. Because people don't believe that they need to go to church to find God. Well, they're right up to a certain point. I can go out in the woods and find God in nature. I can go out west and see God in the Grand Canyon. I can go up in the northwest and visit Yellowstone and I can see God all over the place. But the minute it's time to go back to work, none of that sticks. None of that benefits me and it certainly doesn't help me benefit other people. Because in a time of crisis, I get focused on me again. I get focused on who I am, my self-image, and my desires, and my needs, and my wants. We need church because we need the reminders on a regular basis because the world is distracting. The world is pulling at us in a million different directions. We need the community of other Christians to help us remember what we're really about.
Because there are times when when if we're confronted with the gospel in a really powerful way, there's been evangelists who could do this day in and day out. I mean, they could throw the gospel at you in a way that would change everything about your feelings and the way you're thinking in that moment. You could have an emotional upheaval significant enough to make you run down that aisle and hit your knees and give your life to Jesus Christ. But if you don't learn a new way of thinking, a new way of structuring your life, a new set of values and priorities, that great emotional upheaval is almost never enough. Feeling guilt and shame and reacting to that is no more than a starting point. It's not a finished product. We can all be manipulated into feeling guilty and shameful over the things we've done, but if that's as far as we get, what changes? We have to learn a new way of thinking. And that doesn't come overnight. We must give our hearts to Jesus. That's the emotional side. And we must also give him our minds. And Jesus says that we must be reborn. To become a new person is not just changing our emotions, it's changing the way we think, it's changing the way we go about lives, it's changing the way we look at ourselves and our needs and our wants and our aspirations. It means that we must spend time learning what it means to follow Christ. It's easy to say I'm giving my life to Jesus. It's a lot harder to actually do that. We need to take time to learn what it means to follow Jesus. We need to take time to learn what it means to live in righteousness. We need to take time to learn what it means to serve rather than to be served. And the only way to be reborn is to commit to doing these things on a daily basis. Because most of us are going to get caught up in the distractions of the world if we don't. We must commit to doing these things on a daily basis, not just making a one-time decision. Devout Jews and devout Muslims pray three times a day no matter what's happening in their lives, no matter what's happening around them, at certain times, they stop. Everything stops, and they pray. One of the things that, that really impressed this upon me, I hate to admit it, but it came from a movie called Black Hawk Down. It's based on a true story. Americans were caught in a battle in the middle of Somalia. And they were in the middle of a gunfight. People were dying around them. And at time, time came for the Muslims to pray, the shooting stopped. And they prayed. No matter what happens, they pray. That's an amazing commitment to trying to get right with God. And they're cons they're, it's considered mandatory that they understand their scriptures. 
the one thing that they're missing is the salvation of Jesus Christ. It's the one thing that's missing from that formula. On the other hand, we as Christians, well, we have the salvation of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. We know he died for our sins and was resurrected and conquered death for us. We know that. We have that. But so few of us make seeking his will for our lives a daily commitment. How many Christians do you know that stop what they're doing three times a day to pray? We take it for granted. Imagine what could be accomplished if all of the Christians around the world stopped what they were doing and prayed together three times a day. Imagine what could be accomplished. Imagine what could be done for the transformation of the world. In the Bible where I copied this next verse from, it's, it's titled, The Two Ways. Not two of the ways, not two out of three ways, not some of the ways, the two ways. In other words, it's one way or it's the other. No in-between. This comes from Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but like chaff or that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. Two ways. One or the other. Happy is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. See, it's got to be a priority. You know, that, that self that we've created that lives in the world That's not who we were intended to be. We're not supposed to be so wrapped up in our own little lives that we don't see the need around us, that we don't see the chaos around us, that we're not willing to stop about our busy day when we've got so many important things to do, way more important than getting to know God. Really? We live in a culture that says you need to learn how to love yourself. One of the new hot words in, in counseling is learning how to do self-care. If I knew any more about self-care, I would be even more worthless than I already am. Jesus doesn't say anything about self-care. Jesus says this, Jesus says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. See, an emotional upheaval is not enough. We've got to reprioritize our lives. We've got to put God 
first. Everything else comes after. Everything else comes after. Because if we put God first, everything else falls into place. When Jesus said, deny yourself and pick up your cross, he means that your life must be focused on being who God made you to be. Each and every day, that should be our goal. That should be our purpose. That should be the driving factor of our lives. How many times a day do you pray? How many times a day do you open your Bible? Is it time to recommit to doing these things? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with All that you do, that we're allowed to come together as a family, we ask that you open our hearts, but also our minds. We ask that you help us see how crucial it is that we put our relationship with you first, that we deny ourselves, that we take up our cross. And that we follow the path that your son laid out for us. Grant us wisdom that we may take these things and put them to work in our daily lives. And so be of benefit to all of the wonderful creations and wonderful children that you put around us. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen.